Victor S. Calico Center for the Study of the American Presidency at Hofstra University. It is wonderful to have all of you here today. I'm delighted to welcome you to our uh, fifth annual Lives in Public Policy and Public Service Address. We have a very distinguished speaker, also a Hofstra alum joining us today, Mr. Ray Zaccaro. Um, and who many of us, have, faculty, have had the pleasure of knowing as a student. Ray reminded me this morning that he was in my American presidency class in fall of 1999. Look at that, 20th century. Um, but I'm going to actually, in a moment, turn the podium over to my colleague, Dr. Rosanna Parati, to give the formal introduction, as she has had the pleasure of working not only with Ray not only while he was a student, but as an alum in Washington, D.C., where he has always been so generous with his time and expertise for Hofstra. I have to tell, I'm just going to say a few quick words about the public policy and public service address for which we're inviting Ray to speak and give you a little bit of context. The Hofstra's public policy and public service program was created in 2016, so we're uh, just, uh, just past the five-year mark. Um, the idea was when the Peter S. Calico School of Government, Public Policy and International Affairs was created in 2015 to develop an interdisciplinary major that would encourage students in the social sciences department so that's anthropology, economics, global studies and geography, history, philosophy, political science, religion, and sociology to um, be able to bridge academic study of politics and policymaking with real life practitioner experience. One of our first initiatives in the Public Policy and Public Service Program, PPPS for those of you in the know, was to create um, an annual Lives in Public Policy and Public Service Address. And the goal of this lecture was to bring practitioners in politics and policy making, whether in national government, elected office, uh, advisory, uh, staffing positions, um, interest groups, local, state, national, global policies to bring experts to share their journey in public policy and public service with the community. We have had the pleasure of, this is, Ray is actually our fifth speaker. Four of our sp five speakers have been Hofstra alums. And we initially had scheduled an address in the spring of 2021. Um, it would have been on Zoom. We had to postpone the talk and I remember I remember distinctly when Ray and I were communicating about this, we said, well, maybe in the fall of 21, we'll be able to be in person. Um, given how busy Washington is, and hopefully Ray will give us some insights into what's happening there, uh, or what's been happening in the past week, we offered um, our speaker the opportunity to still deliver the address on Zoom. He insisted that he would be glad to come to campus and make time in an incredibly busy schedule to be here on person, in person. And so it is such an honor to have you here, Ray. Rosanna's going to give the formal introduction in a moment. Let me just say that uh, I wanted to thank, of course, Dr. Parati and Dr. Himmelfarb for bringing their classes, Dr. Dudek, Chair of Political Science, for joining us today, um, the Office of University Relations for publicizing this talk so widely. I know we have so many people here and people. It's being live streamed as well. Thank you audio, video, visual services for making this all come together so smoothly. And of course, um, our Hofstra Cultural Center, um, Janine Rinaldi, Carol Mallison, and Athlene Collins. Thank you for, uh, um, and of course, our wonderful photographer, Phil, um, for so many uh, your flexibility and good cheer with our schedule changes and itinerary developments is greatly appreciated. With that, I'm going to turn the uh, podium to my colleague, Dr. Parati, to give the formal introduction for our speaker. Thank you. I can't really remember exactly the first time that Ray Zaccaro came into my office when he was a student. It was probably about 25 years ago. He said that he had transferred up to Hofstra after going to school in D.C. Um, and he became a student in, uh, I don't know, one, two or more of my classes. I can't even remember now. Um, I'm so used to having him as a colleague. It was our good fortune 
that he transferred up here. The time I do remember vividly was uh, was around the same time when he was studying here at Havsha. My kids and I, and they were aged probably two and four, ran into him at Phelps Lane Park in our mutual hometown of North Babylon. And Ray was toting or schlepping or driving in a pickup um, a bunch of equipment for a musical. There was a Seymour the Plant costume, there were other accoutrements of Little Shop of Horrors, and my kids were mystified. We ultimately went to see the show. Ray at that point was already involved in putting on community theater in our little town. Um, we went on to see such great productions put on by his father, uh, who's uh, uh, in theater, and who might talk about that later, um, and uh, Ray. We went to see Oklahoma and a number of other things, and Ray and his dad were in large part responsible for my daughter's becoming completely enamored, she was the two-year-old, with musicals and show tunes. She floods the house with them to this day, and she's 25 years old. They helped her to overcome her shyness. So to me, Ray became one of those people that you think about as brightening the lives of your children, deepening their experience, making them better people. And that's exactly what he's done for our PSC students, our political science students who've traveled to Washington for most of the time he's been serving there. I can't think about our Washington trip without also thinking about Ray huddled with a group of students in a Capitol Hill office or maybe in a lunchroom that's loud and everybody's kind of crowded together over a table because we can't find any other space. Ray huddled with a group in the hallway talking passionately about government service. Ray has been communications director in the office of U.S. Senator Jeff Merkley of Oregon since 2014. One of his main responsibilities is to help craft messaging for the Democrats in the Senate. Before working for Senator Merkley, he was communications director for uh, Representative Frank Pallone of New Jersey, and he worked with House Democratic leaders. He served as communications director for U.S. Representative Carol McCarthy of here on Long Island. He graduated from Hofstra in 2001, and he got his start in politics running for North Babylon School Board in our hometown at age 18. During his Hofstra years, he ran unsuccessfully for the legislative seat held by Paul Tunna uh, in Suffolk County. Uh, Tunna was then presiding officer of Suffolk County Legislator, Suffolk County Legislature, and that just gives you some idea of um, his um, his zest for politics and his moxie, um, he challenged the most powerful person on the county legislature. Um, I am proud and happy, we are all happy, uh, to share with you um, this moment with Ray Zaccaro. Oh, uh, thank you, Dr. Prati, and I uh, uh, appreciate that warm welcome and certainly take no credit for your children's success or enjoyment of musical theater. <laughs> um, I'll give that one to my dad, actually. Um, I, well, I need to start out by saying what an honor it is for me to be invited back to Hofstra as a guest as opposed to a paying customer like all of you. Um, you know, and to return to such a special place and not play not only a formidable role in, in, in my academic and professional journey, but to my very existence. Um, when people say they would not be where they are without their alma mater, in my case, that is true. This is a little bit of my history here at Hofstra University. I'm that guy in the middle. Um, uh, modeling career didn't work out, as you can tell. I don't have the hair for it. Um, my father, who graduated from Hofstra College before it was Hofstra University, became an adjunct professor here. And that's how he had the great fortune of meeting my mother, who was his student. So uh, it was the 60s. Things were different. I don't judge. Um, glad it happened. Um, some might not be. Um, but I'm proud to boast on behalf of my family, between four of us, including my brilliant and talented sister, we have obtained seven degrees from this institution between undergraduate and graduate studies. Which is why today I'm so excited to announce my campaign for the renaming of this building to be the Zaccaro Family Not Yet Memorial Library. 
Uh, we've definitely paid for a brick or two here, maybe, maybe more. Um, but all joking aside, I, I have to say for you students here from Dr. Himmelfarb and Dr. Parati's classes, I am so jealous of you because I loved those classes. I have, as I was saying earlier, I think I kept every textbook from every class I took at Hofstra. And the same goes for my class with Dr. Bose and Dr. Feldman and, and uh, Dr. Landis, who is a former chair of the department. Um, and I, I have to make a special acknowledgement to one person who continues to be a mentor and a friend and a confidant and a sounding board, who's Dr. Parati. Uh, Dr. Parati has patiently listened to me complain about the state of American politics and more specifically my role in it for, I, I cannot believe that it's more than 20 years. And, it's a weird feeling when you realize that you are old enough to say you've known somebody for two decades and you met them when you were an adult. Um, Dr. Parati, your guidance and friendship and support have been a rock upon which I and so many others have been fortunate to stand. And to say I'm grateful to you is beyond an understatement. And I know that the Hofstra community grows better every day because of your generosity of spirit, your dedication, your intellect, and your genuine care for the students and this institution. Thank you. Um, yes, please. It, it seems strange to me to talk to you about how I got to my career when I feel like I'm in the midst of still figuring it out, but I guess that's life, and just for all you know, you know, for 20 years hence, you will still feel like you're still figuring it out, at the risk of sounding like a commencement speaker. Um, but it's, uh, since I started with my birth, I should probably move a little faster than this. Uh, <laughs> We're going to be here for a long time. Oops, I just moved too fast, so you all know you got a preview. Um, ah, I'm terrible at PowerPoint, so um, 20 years of practice doesn't get you much. Um, so after working across all levels of government and politics, from the smallest municipalities to the United States Senate, I've obviously seen a lot. Um, I've had the honor of coming to work in the House of Representatives as an intern, and then years later as communications director for several members of Congress. And then I was fortunate to make the long trek across the hall to the Capitol building and to the Senate to work for Senator Merkley from Oregon almost eight years ago. Senator Merkley, I just want to say a couple of words about him. Um, he is a brilliant, kind, and as we say in Yiddish, mensch. Um, he has the most voracious work ethic of anyone I've ever known, and it has been the honor of my life to work for him. And I'm not just saying that in case he's watching this live stream, and I hope he's not. If he is, I would encourage him to spend time doing something far more important. We have a lot of important things on our agenda right now. Um, but some of the highlights of my time with Senator Merkley include this moment. <laughs> um, Senator Merkley held the, one of the longest speeches in the history of the Senate, 15 hours and 28 minutes. And it was in response to the effort by Senator McConnell to do what I believe to be one of the most significant, commit one of the most significant crimes against the Constitution in American history by blocking the power of a president to fill a Supreme Court nomination, the Supreme Court opening, and also by blocking the Senate from doing its constitutional duty of advisor consent. So this image here is us bringing bagels, as it says, apologizing to the Senate floor staff who we made stay overnight. Um, I had actually been at work for 42 hours straight with only an hour break for a shower at that point. Um, and other uh, uh, moments that stand out to me is leading the opposition to many of Trump administration's troubling policies for Senate Democrats, including the Muslim ban and the DACA reversal. I got to write a primetime speech for him that he delivered at the Democratic National Convention. That was pretty cool. And uh, it was probably one of the most profound experiences of my life, professional or personal, was when he and I jumped on a plane and went down to McAllen, Texas, and were the first two people to walk into a child prison where we saw the effects of the Trump administration's policy of family separation to inflict harm and damage on parents and children as a deterrent for leaving their war-torn and gang-riddled countries. And uh, it's hard to ever be the same after witnessing a crime against humanity like that, so it really stands out in my mind. And then, only an hour later, we drove a little bit further to another child prison and almost got arrested together. So that was cool. Um, I actually thought I was going to go to jail and uh, managed to snap a couple of pictures in the process. 
And since I interned, oh, and it was two impeachments, two impeachments. That's something to remember for your career. But since I interned for Jerry Nadler, um, the, when he was on the Senate, uh, House Judiciary Committee, rather, in uh, the 90s during the Clinton impeachment, I have one of the rare distinction of being one of the few people who has played a professional part in three presidential impe impeachments. Um, that is not something to applaud, so I'm glad you held that applause. Um, it's just a matter of timing. As they say, timing's everything. And I've been born in any other period in American history. I would not have had that distinction. Um, but nothing that I had experienced prior was anything on the order of magnitude of what January 6, 2021 was for me. And I'd love to talk more about that later in the Q&A, but um, to be clear, I was not on the Capitol that day. I was actually here in New York with my family. But I watched live as the doors of our office was ripped off its hinges, the contents of our office destroyed, including personal belongings that were stolen, government assets that were ransacked and just pilloried. pilloried. It was an emotional experience to witness, and, and uh, I'd, I'd love to talk more about it. And I also have an interesting historic parallel from another era uh, that I think would be instructive for us to understand what exactly happened there. But when a republic like ours becomes susceptible to raging masses, when, when government ceases to be able to protect the core of democracy, when it seems like we can't do anything, it begs the question, what the hell is going on? Why can't we get anything done? Why does Congress always look like a snake eating its own tail? Why are we all just a little or very disgusted with every part of it? I don't have to tell you that things are weird. You're all sitting here in masks. But our culture, our politics, our communities, even our families and friends are beyond divided. We're living on a separate planet and being informed by separate sets of largely contradictory information. And a government that is supposed to be a backstrop for, to prevent the slide away from democratic ideals of our republic, it, it just seems incapable of functioning altogether and it's filled with the feckless. The fears of division were at the forefront of the minds of our founding fathers too and they were afraid of moments like this. And Thomas Jefferson, this quote, I'll just read it. I'm, a schism in our union would be an incredible evil because mere friends falling out never reunite cordially. Whereas all of us going together, we shall be sure to cure the evils of our new constitution before they do great harm. Oops, a little late for that. I don't need to go down the road of debunking outlandish conspiracy theories promulgated in the dark corners of the internet on Fox News, or like baby blood drinking lizards who use their satanic rituals to share child pornography in the basement of a pizza place in DC that actually has no basement, incidentally. Or that the weather is controlled by a cabal of Jewish bankers who use lasers to make storms. Or, you know, so many other really regrettable and bizarre conspiracies that too many people in our country believe to be true, but so much of the electorate has been pumped up and manipulated and uninformed or, or really intentionally misinformed. And I'd remiss if I didn't touch on our media landscape too, and since this is what I do for a living and, and I think about and I talk to and I work with the press, well, the fact is some of what passes as news is anything but. But the idea that by tapping into a gullible, dissatisfied, willing part of society with the use of rhetoric, appealing to the deepest fears and insecurities, is nothing new. The same can be said about the ability to make the fringe the norm. Now, the first and most obvious example that comes to mind is the burning of the Reichstag in, um, in Germany. Um, one of the moments that's considered to be a tipping point in World War II. The idea that a political party whose principles and ideology were based on outlandish conspiracy theories and only had a small percentage of representation from the electorate would make those insidious evil ideas the guiding philosophy that would control the nation and give it its wherewithal to march across a continent in an effort to global dominance, that's nothing new. We've seen these patterns repeated over and over and over again. But it's not just our divided culture that's brought us march on the march of progress to a halt. Many of us are losing faith in the very institution of democracy ourselves. 
itself, rather. As an exhaustive study by the University of Cambridge conducted in 2020, it was found that 58% of Americans were dissatisfied with democracy. Not our democracy, democracy. The Constitution, I'm going to get there. But from my vantage point, having spent maybe a little too much time on the inside, I can think of a ton of reasons why we are where we are. But let's start at the very beginning, because as the song says, it's a very good place to start. One of the plays that Dr. Prati's children came to see, The Sound of Music, the Constitution. So much of what slowed us down and moved us backwards has been the idea that progress is, is dangerous and the, the will of the people is less important than maintaining the systems that hurt the many to protect the powerful and the privileged few. This is what Thomas Jefferson thought about the idea of leaving the Constitution as it is. There is some who would suggest that we must adhere fully and absolutely to the intent and words of the Founding Fathers, but those people are not only wrong about what the Founding Fathers intended, they make it out to seem as if they were prophets receiving the Constitution on Mount Sinai. What we are doing would be as unpredictable to them as the idea that we regularly fly around the world or have access to all the world's knowledge in our pockets and every TikTok ever made. We have, as a nation, married ourselves to a document debated and written in 1787. 1787. Let's think about what we know of the world in 1787. Well, the founding fathers, who are all fathers, by the way, and no mothers, sisters, daughters, etc., knew little more about electricity than Benjamin Franklin's experiments with keys and kites. But it is with great fidelity that we, as a nation, have adapted to the guiding principle that we must hold steadfast to the ideas of long-dead men written on sheepskin with quills the technology of the day. Can anybody tell me the last time the Constitution was amended? In show of hands, does anybody in here know the most recent, last amendments to the Constitution? Go ahead. Close, it was 27th Amendment in 1992. Just a numbers thing, right? That was, that was close, that's great. Um, 1992, which was before most of the people in this room were born, it was a perfect example of what goes wrong in American politics. The 27th Amendment was correcting leftover business from the Constitutional Convention in Philadelphia. Now that is moving at the speed and pace of government. And it was about pay raises for Congress to boot. But before that one, we hadn't amended the Constitution on anything since 1971, which gave everybody in here the right to vote when you turned 18. And the 25th Amendment, which was just one more back, which addressed the Constitution's glaring omissions of presidential term limits and clarified line of executive accession, was ratified in 1967. That sounds like it's not that far off from 71, but know that it was a quarter of a century that it took to address the issue that it wanted to correct for after President Roosevelt died, the only more than two-term president. Well, Thomas Jefferson thought that the Constitution should be revised every 19 years. It's another thought by him. And that's because people had a life expectancy of like 35. You know, they, 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 they died by bleeding themselves to death when they had a cold. If you don't believe me, Google how George Washington died. No antibiotics, no hand washing for surgery, no anesthesia for surgery. But, oh, George Washington did require inoculations against smallpox. So for those who claim to be really conservative, strict constructionists, maybe it's worth considering precedent on that law, too. Our inability to amend the Constitution and keep it relevant in the society in which we live and the needs of Americans, the first and, to me, one of the most fatal flaws of our government. Jefferson knew that. And we amended our Constitution immediately. They did it ten times right out of the gates. We're bearing more fidelity to a document which in its own greatest advocates and even its drafters believe should be flexible and changeable with time. Not that it should be ignored the way Mitch McConnell ignored it when he stole that Senate seat. Well, didn't really ignore the Constitution, but ignored other rules, and we'll get to that later. But did ignore the Constitution on the idea of a president's right to appoint a Supreme Court justice and Congress's job to vote on that justice. But they thought it shouldn't be ignored. They thought it was a living document. Well, if it's a living document, it's on life support in a very vegetative state. 
So what should we do? So this is what Jefferson thought we should do. So, oops, I went ahead too fast. Um, we could, and we should, if we really want to honor the origins of this nation, do what they did in Philadelphia when the Articles of Confederation turn out to no longer meet the needs of a new and growing nation. Throw the damn thing out and start again. That's what they wanted us to do. That's what they fought and bled for. Or oh, we can keep the superfluities and beautiful language. And, you know, like one of the best parts of living in D.C., I have to tell you, is just being around all of these landmarks and everything. And, I, you know, I can go to the National Archives whenever I want. And when I do, I, I look in absolute awe. My eyes well and my chest fills with pride at the accomplishments of my nation as they're written out under bulletproof glass. When I look at that document, though, I, I, I notice that it is an idea. It is not a marriage certificate. But fidelity to the Constitution seems to be more a matter of convenience for some, specifically in the body with which I am most familiar with, the Senate. I know most of you heard a lot about a little thing called the Senate filibuster. Now, before eyes glaze over, on, if I haven't lost you already, instead of focusing on an arcane rule, I want to walk you through what happens in real life and in real time when the democracy and nearly every idea dies right there in the Senate. The example I'll use, it's probably a pretty trivial bill I want to talk about. Um, you know, it's not really that important since the Senate's voted five times and hasn't passed. It's just a little thing about, you know, giving every American the right to vote. It's no big deal. Um, not really an important thing in this country or in a defining rule of democracy, just voting. But let me walk you through why I think it might be one of the most possibly least legitimate actions that your government uses every day to thwart and ignore you and your will. So one of the things I am proudest of in my tenure for working with Senator Merkley is um, his authorship of the For the People Act and his efforts to bring voting rights reform from an idea to a reality. And the bill is designed to secure voting rights for all Americans, take dark money out of politics, and put a stop to voter suppression and partisan gerrymandering, and end the rigging of the system that favors the powerful over the people. And I've worked on that bill and been a part of trying to pass it for more than half of my time in the Senate in some manner or form. And I believe it to be the single most important initiative before Congress on the single most important issue facing our nation, making sure that all Americans, regardless of who they are, have the ability and right to vote in a system that is designed to enshrine democracy, not debilitate it. We have nothing as a democracy if we can't secure the rights of Americans to vote freely. And if we're bound to continue in a system that is controlled by whomever contributes the most money to political campaigns, then we definitely can't say we're, our republic is a democracy anymore. Does anybody know why the Senate hasn't passed this critical bill? I'll give you one guess. Well, it's the filibuster. As you kind of drew that conclusion. Before the People Act passed the House and it was voted on the Senate, and it got, are you ready for this? I'm not good at math. And a body of 100 people got 51 votes. Notice I didn't talk about any of my math classes here at Hofstra. But I do know that 51 is more than half of 100. By a show of hands, who's been hearing about or knows vaguely what the filibuster is and how it works? I imagine you've all dealt with it in your classes somehow. Dr. Helen Farb, I'm glad you addressed that. Um, but can anybody tell me where in the Constitution you find the definition of the filibuster, where, where the, the, the James Madison or the Founding Fathers wrote about the filibuster? Anybody remember that from your classes? What article it appears or what the phrasing of it is in the Constitution, how they describe it? I'm glad none of you answered because the answer is that it is not in the Constitution at all. The filibuster was about as familiar to James Madison when he wrote the Constitution as this computer. So what is the filibuster? Well, sometimes I don't even know. The word filibuster comes from a Dutch word called freebooter, which means pirate. 
Eventually, the word took on the meeting of someone who would take control as a pirate of the legislature. This is where I was supposed to have a picture of Johnny Depp and, uh, uh, and I forgot about it. Um, and it's an act that stops the mission of the Senate to allow one person to block whatever they're working on. The other 99, one person can stop progress. And the filibuster was a rule, not a constitutional decree that was adopted by the Senate years after the Constitution was ratified. And it's gone through many versions, but in its current form, it is used to stop the ability of a vote, a bill, or a nomination, or an amendment by requiring a supermajority of 60 votes to move from talking about a bill, it's a debate, to actually motion to proceed, meaning to vote on the thing. So in the Senate, we debate a bill on the floor, and we have cloture vote. It's called a cloture vote. It's a very strange, funny word, and not a word that we used until 1917 in this form. And then they get to a vote on whether or not this thing's going to pass or fail. So when you see something that's got 54 votes in a body of 100, like the commission to study what happened on January 6th, but it fails, that's why. I've been asked a million times by friends, reporters, family, why haven't we passed voting rights reform? When we see states throughout the nation try for the first time since Jim Crow to limit instead of expand voting rights. And we know this is an incredibly popular issue with the public. Democrat, Republican, Independent, everybody thinks we need some sort of protection for our rights to vote. And the answer is that it only takes one senator to object on ending debate on a bill and moving on to voting it. And the worst part is that they can do this in silence and in secret with no explanation. You heard that right. Any unnamed, unknown senator can secretly block a bill as important as the For the People Act without anyone knowing who did it or why. And then it takes 60 senators, a supermajority, to bypass said mystery senator to move forward. You know, the things we deal with in the Senate are high stakes, to say the least. Getting 60 people to agree on anything is a very challenging burden. It's about maybe how many people are in this room. Can we all agree on what we want for lunch? Can you agree on what the future of voting in this country could look like? Well, the guys who wrote the Constitution knew this was a bad idea. And here's one of the, these slides, or what they thought about the idea of supermajority rule. It gets even better. We didn't have this kind of filibuster idea and a vote to stop debate and all these machinations until 1917. And from, 1907, from 1887, from the drafting of the Constitution, to 1917, this instrument, the filibuster, to stop a vote was used, well, that's a long time, right? How many times do you think? We use it almost every day now. Seven times. Seven times a filibuster was used to kill a bill. And now... I think we sometimes do it seven times a day. And the majority of its uses, until the Civil Rights Act, it was mostly used as an instrument to uphold the racist policies of this country, uphold Jim Crow, uphold, stop further civil rights movements earlier in the process than they eventually were stopped legally. And the secretive method used the filibuster, it's only been around since 1975, and it was an unintended consequence of a rules change. 188 years after the Constitution's written. We can go into the why in the Q&A, but the idea is that next time you're thinking about why we're, things are so screwed up in this country, why we can't do something as fundamental as protecting the right to vote for all Americans, this is why so that congressional districts can be rigged to keep sending the same hacks back to Congress over and over and over again, so that people who represent the states with changing demographics can stay in office regardless of who they represent because they can make it impossible for anybody who would vote against them to do so. So that they can get billions of dollars in campaign donations to pay for the kinds of ads and conspiracy machines that rip us apart so they can keep doing business as usual and never, ever 
have to give in to a silly little thing like the will of the people. I know it's bad and it's really hard to work in that environment. So if you were hoping to hear something more inspirational and optimistic today and uplifting, I'm sorry, I will disappoint you, much like almost every professor here who I did have when they saw my papers. Um, but I, we actually do have hope here. We can fix this. There is a way to write the course. And I have to get religious here, but when I think about the filibuster and what I'd like to see happen to this version of it, I think about a Bible verse from Genesis. You are made from dust and you shall return to dust. The filibuster in its current form, it just materialized. It's not real, but it has very real consequences. It can go away without taking away the ability of the Senate minority, be they Democrat or Republican, to stand up for their convictions and not get railroaded. Let's start with that part, the standing up part. This is a scene from probably one of my favorite movies of all time. If you've never seen it, Mr. Smith Goes to Washington. If you can tolerate black and white, it's worth it. Much more inspiring than I am. But I don't know about you. This is what I learned when I learned about the filibuster. When I was in my high school government class or American history or at any point in my life when I heard that term for the first time, I was told that a filibuster meant that a senator talked until they couldn't talk anymore and that they could use that speech to convince their colleagues to see things their way. And, and if they didn't, well, they didn't win, so be it. That's life. That's democracy. Well, that's not the way the filibuster works anymore. But it can. We can bring back the talking filibuster. We can make senators have some skin in the game. You know, when, when I stayed awake for those 42 hours uh, and working with Senator Merkley as he stood on the floor for 15 hours and 28 minutes with no bathroom break, no food break, couldn't sit down, couldn't stop talking. I really believe that if we were doing something other than just speechifying, and if Mitch McConnell hadn't changed the rules to suit him when it was convenient, then maybe we could have prevented that theft, that great crime against the Constitution of a Supreme Court seat. And there are other proposals, too, and I'm happy to talk about them. Here, here, here are a few, and I can get into more detail later. But all of this can go the way of the dinosaurs that it currently protects. The Senate can be restored. We don't have to live like this. We can once again call the Senate the greatest deliberative body on earth if we allow it to deliberate. This must be the charge and cause of our nation, which sounds funny to say the charge and cause of our nation should be a Dutch word that means pirate and sounds funny. But the filibuster is it's, it's like a carnival game that's rigged to make it unwinnable under any circumstances. You think you can win, but you can't. Now, I don't know how our democracy can survive if we're going to continue to be more concerned about upholding a 46-year-old scheme than protecting the ideals of a 245-year-old republic. And I'll close with this. A few years ago, at the beginning of the Trump administration, when the new president began spreading a lot of lies on a wide range of topics, the paper of record in the nation's capital, the Washington Post, changed its masthead saying, right underneath its title, to democracy dies in darkness. And it was a nod to their plan to expose the truth in the face of lies and from the bully pulpit of the presidency itself and from beyond, specifically that president's assault on the First Amendment. You see, democracy is the greatest fear of leaders with something to lose money and power. But the Post, as I often have told their reporters and editors on other matters that I disagreed with them, was wrong on this one. Democracy doesn't begin a death spiral in darkness necessarily. Democracy dies on the Senate floor, brought to you live by C-SPAN for everybody to see. Well, nobody watches C-SPAN, so nobody sees it. Democracy dies on cable news when it's slaughtered by bumbling pundits and lazy reporters. Democracy dies online in Fox News. Democracy dies in the hands of its assassins like Tucker Carlson. Democracy dies when legislative rigor mortis prevents us from even amending it, Constitution. 
Democracy dies when the body is so riddled with the disease of the filibuster that it can no longer function. But democracy has the strongest and most powerful army in human history to protect it. It can save itself if its army shows up. And that's you. You're its army. And you have to take up arms to protect your democracy. And I'm not talking about guns. I'm talking about your arms, your legs, the rest of your bodies when you go vote. Because when in the course of human events, it becomes necessary for one people to dissolve the political bands with which have connected them with another and to assume among the powers of the earth the separate and equal station to which the laws of nature and nature's God entitle them. A decent respect to the opinions of mankind requires that they should declare their causes and impel that separation. I wish I wrote that, I didn't. We can separate from the oppression and the mishaps and the crimes brought by the filibuster, by our unwillingness to amend the Constitution, by this idea that we should go from American exceptionalism to American acceptance. And we have to, because as Speaker Pelosi likes to say, nothing short of the survival of our republic is at stake. Thank you for having me here today. What's next? <laughs> So I think we'll uh, ask a couple of questions and then we'll just get things started. And let me encourage you students especially to jot down your questions and get ready to ask them. Um, so Ray, I wanted to just go into a, li a little bit further um, the that last slide, um, the recommendations that you have for changing filibuster, sure. um, because not all of us may be legislative experts. So um, lowering the number um, required to invoke cloture, we can understand that, make it lower than 60. Which has happened in the past. It, it was 67. And in 1975, they lowered it to 60 to stop some gridlock. But in that process, by an accident, an omission, that created the ability for a senator to secretly hold a filibuster without speaking on the floor, without doing anything other than just sending a message to the cloakroom. Um, tell us about carve-outs. So carve-outs are an interesting idea. You know, and, and all the things that are on that, that uh, slide, I should have kept it up over there. Um, but all of those ideas are just ideas. They're, none of them are, are concrete proposals right now, but they're ideas that folks from think tanks throughout the nation have, have come up with. The University of Chicago is working on a project right now to take submissions of ideas of how to reform the filibuster. It's a group called Fix Our Senate that a close friend of mine, uh, Ellie Zubnick, former communications director for Patty Murray, um, helps uh, uh, with uh, that organization. There are a lot of ideas. Um, the carve out is one that's a little bit controversial because what it says is that we should, in matters of something as grave and important as democracy and the right to vote, we should make an exception to the filibuster rule and carve out that democracy the way that we do with budget reconciliation. So you guys have all been hearing about budget reconciliation and this big bill, the Build Back Better bill. And the truth is that budget reconciliation is the result of a carve out. That says that in the budget process, when it is a matter of, 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 of finance, and I can get into further detail on that, it's a very confusing topic, and a lot of experts have, have uh, stumbled explaining that, and I'm sure I will too. Um, but 
that carve-out idea has happened. So there's precedent. And that's the interesting thing about the Senate and the rules in the Senate is that precedent is everything. And it's the most recent precedent that counts. It's, it's, not, it's not a previous precedent because that would be easy. We could just say, you know what? There's precedent for the old rules. Let's go back. It's, it's, the, it's the, the current and most recent precedent. So carve-out is one idea. Just one other, and then I'll shift to Dr. Hemelfarb. Allowing both sides to offer amendments to bills. Again, those of us who are not legislative experts would ask, isn't that already allowed? No. It is, theoretically, but we have not had an open amendment process in the Senate in a very long time. It's a term we like to call regular order, um, meaning this is the way things are supposed to work. And one of the proposals that, that has come up has been the idea of allowing each side, I don't know if this is a round number, let's, say, well, let's say four or five amendments to a bill. Well. If I'm Republicans and this is a Democratic controlled Senate, whoa, I can amend this bill to maybe modify it in a way that I could get behind voting for it, have some skin in the game on that as well. And if I'm a Democrat and then get everything in the bill I wanted, well, I can amend it and add it there too. We don't do that anymore in the Senate. We just do not do that. Oh, okay. Um, <clears throat> first of all, thank you for. Um, invoking Thomas Jefferson, mm -hmm. okay? He, you know, he's an extraordinarily important American thinker. Um, he is a man who had all kinds of ideas that are worth serious contemplation. Um, I feel, you know, thankful to you because, you know, here at Hofstra, we've basically canceled Thomas Jefferson. We had a statue of him outside of our student center, and it's it's no longer there. I, I remember the statue, and... and uh and to a certain degree, my relief of seeing it gone, because as much as I need Thomas Jefferson, and I rely on Thomas Jefferson, mm -hmm. I think about Thomas Jefferson all the time, I don't do it with ignorance to who he was and what he did as mm -hmm. a man. But, uh, you know, we're on Long Island, so I'll, I'll quote a famous Long Islander, Walt Whitman, which is, uh, do I contradict myself? Very well, then I contradict myself. I'm a large and contain multitudes. And if we're going to accept anything of the Constitution mm -hmm. and the Founding Fathers, we need to accept that idea, that they were full of contradictions. I agree. Um, let me ask you a question about what happened last Tuesday. So last Tuesday we had elections. And it seems as if um, the country gave a thumbs down to sort of the great progressive agenda in practically every possible way. Um, people um, gave thumbs down to the wokeism that you're seeing in schools. They gave a thumbs down to defunding the police. They gave a thumbs down to high taxes. And they did it in a whole variety of ways in different parts of the country. I mean, we did it here very profoundly on Long Island where, you know, basically Republicans ran the table in virtually any, every competitive election. So do you think that the country was basically saying, no, we don't, you know, we don't want this great progressive agenda? So I take exception to that idea as, as a progressive, um, as somebody who spends their lives promoting a lot of those ideas. Um, I don't think it was necessarily what James Carville said as a rejection of wokeism, per se. What I think it was, well, first of all, it was sloppy politics. If you go down by some of those races, I think that uh, um, in the case of Virginia, which is close to my new home, not my Long Island home, uh, I could tell you that there are myriad reasons why Terry McAuliffe lost that race. Some of them have to do with the candidate himself. But one of the most important reasons why Terry McAuliffe lost that race is because a key feature of that election and the debate around that election became this three-word phrase, critical race theory. As if in every public school in Virginia, every single student was going to be taught one thing and one thing only, that any heritage that comes from anything other than a prescribed thought is somehow wrong. And that is exactly the opposite of what that idea is. And the idea that parents wouldn't be able to have influence over their children's education. Let me ask you when the last time education actually played a role, like real education policy played a role in an election in this country. 
real education policy. This isn't real education policy. This is a three-word phrase that if you take off critical and you take off theory, it makes the election about the word in the middle, race. And at our core, and the principles that have upheld the filibuster until 1975, as I as mentioned earlier, there is a lot of racism to discuss in this country. And discussing it in an academic setting is perfectly fine. And critical race theory, by the way, is not something that's ever been taught in a public school ever, ever, ever. It's a legal theory taught in law schools, and only a few law schools, only a handful of law schools. So no, I, I take exception to the idea that it was progressivism that, 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 that caused it. If anything, I go back to what I was talking about in the last part of my speech, which is that the filibuster, government dysfunction, dissatisfaction with democracy, dissatisfaction with the idea that we can't do a damn thing well. That goes beyond, that transcends Democrat, Republican, that transcends progressives and conservatives. That is disgusting to voters. It is repellent to voters. It makes them stay home. It makes them throw their hands up. And it makes the people who show up the angry ones, the ones who don't like any of it. That's what I think happened in these elections. And I think Democrats fell asleep at the switch. I think the fact that we spent the better part of a year fumbling on core principles to our government, like reigniting our economy and rebuilding this nation, and oh, by the way, again, protecting voting rights, that's disheartening. You know, I think back to the Obama administration in the same midterm, well, pre-midterm election, in that same period, 2009, we were getting pilloried because it looked like the Democrats couldn't get anything done after electing this man who's soaring rhetoric made me made us all think we could do anything and we did nothing except for really bungle the affordable care act and what did that cost democrats again in 2010 it cost us a majority so i i, I think that that those issues had as much to play with everything as woke I, culture i think that woke culture is a misnomer i think the reality is that opening our eyes to reality and to people's suffering and to our better understanding of our own history that's not a crime. Absolutely. Um, oh, I, I'd really like to open this up to student questions. And we have plenty of questions that we could continue to answer, but we really want to get to listening to you. Um, is that Erickson back there? Do you want to come up here, Erickson, or speak really loud? And then, I guess if you have a question, you can yeah, line, just up. line up. Yeah, uh, by line the way, up. I love your Hofstra gear. You are like totally in theme for today for me. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. Um, uh, you were talking about education and race before, so I just wanted to know what role should the federal government play in eliminating racial disparities in investment, discipline, and access to quality learning options in American schools? Look. I mean, most of the federal government's responsibility when it comes to education is financial, it's funding. Um, curriculum is not something that the federal government really engages in. And it's the idea is to provide education and opportunities to everybody equally in this country. And that's the role of the federal government, make sure those opportunities are available. Now, in terms of my own personal beliefs on on the larger issue, look, I, I've never met anybody who said that too much information was too much. And I think if you're armed with facts and you're armed with history and knowledge, uh, that's the only way you can ever make really informed decisions. So I don't necessarily say nobody really that I know of is advocating for any federal role in curriculum development. And I think that that's part of one of the misinformation practices that, that helped Terry McAuliffe lose that race. Anybody else have a question? C come on up, come on up, Kai. Uh, again, if you're turning through a question in your head, you get just, in line and just get in line. articulating it in your head and you'd be able to ask it. Um, if I recall correctly, I think um, Senator Markley is one of the few senators who actually supports Medicare for All. 
And I want to ask, how do we move moderate Democrats into the direction of progressive policies? How do we change the Overton window? And also, I wanted to ask, how do we specifically move these two moderate um, Democratic senators who are holding up the process for the rest of the, the, um, the building? Those are excellent questions, and I, I'm grateful for you for asking them because uh, it's something I, I, I think about a lot. Um, so, Senator Merkley does support Medicare for All, but when you ask how we bridge the transom, like how, how do we get people to move, we also have another bill called the Choose Medicare Act. And the idea, the Choose Medicare Act, was to do what the intention was of the original idea of the Affordable Care Act, to allow for a public option. In this case, it's buy into Medicare as an option, as a choice. Choose Medicare. You have a choice. We'll make it available to you. You don't have to be 65. We'll make it available to everybody. If you want to buy into Medicare and use Medicare as a primary insurance, as opposed to going through a private insurer. I mean, there are a lot of benefits for that. I mean, one, one benefit is you never hear anybody who's 65 or older says, oh, I'm so annoyed that I have Medicare. My mom has Medicare. My father had Medicare. Their health care needs would never have been able to be met. And the more people that buy into that system, the more stable it is. The more flexible, the more funding there is. So, so that's it. And on the question of, of uh, Senators Manchin and Cinema, you know, I, I was thinking about that on the car ride over here today. And I, you know, um, these are two people who I've gotten to know in some way over the years, whether it's through their staff or, or personally. And I will tell you that I don't necessarily know what's at the cause of their aversion to filibuster reform in particular. Um, but what I do know is that they're averse to filibuster elimination. Whether they remain re opposed to some of those ideas that I had up on the slides before, that remains to be seen because we can fix the filibuster without throwing it out. We can get to a place where we have conversations without having no conversations. And I think where it comes to Senator, Mer Senator Manchin and, and Senator Sinema, um, I think they have different motivations for where they are. Together, they, they may seem like they're coming from the same page, but I think that they're not. I think they're on different planets also. Um, I, I'm very close with some folks in Senator Manchin's office. And in fact, I, we were on the same floor with him for like six, seven years that I worked there. And um, I can tell you that, that I, I don't know if Senator Manchin necessarily knows why he is standing up on this. But I do think when we talk about the For the People Act as an example, now we have changed the For the People Act three times, made three different bills. And then we took another bill. You may have heard of the John Lewis Voting Rights Act. And the John Lewis Voting Rights Bill is really funny to me because really the John Lewis Bill didn't really matter as much without the For the People Act because you needed a lot of the provisions in the For the People Act for John Lewis and vice versa. There's a kind of a, a, a circular system there. But the idea that we changed voting rights reform because we wanted to work with Senator Manchin. You talk about how you bring people together because he was insistent on the idea that he could bring Republicans to the table because voting rights are just fundamental to everything that we stand for in this country. And despite four different times, and then another time on the John Lewis bill, he wasn't able to get a single Republican except until John Lewis, he got Lisa Murkowski. So we can try, but when Mitch McConnell gives an order to his caucus that no one is to vote in favor of voting rights, Something fundamentally has to change. That's, that's when I talked about the armies of democracy. You gotta vote. That's it. That's the only way you silence them. All right, Ray, can you hear me? Mm. Yeah. Ray, first of all, thank you so much for providing students this opportunity for the uh, inside view. I'm a member of the Calico Advisory Board. And uh, listening to you in part was like a little bit watching a mirror. I started on Capitol Hill as an intern. I worked on the House side. I then went over to the Senate side. And if that's not enough, my former boss, Senator Carl Levin, was also called a mensch. <laughs> so 
and worked with us on the Volcker rule, which which is uh, to me one of the, the biggest accomplishments Senator Merkley had in his career when Senator Levin helped guide that process through to create a firewall between banks and, and their uh, uh, other purchases. So well, I'm, I'm intrigued by your comments on the filibuster because um, I, I think we come to the same conclusion but from a different historic perspective. As Senator Levin's legislative director, I wrote letters to the cloakroom placing a hold on a bill saying I, I asked for uh, to be specifically notified if such and such bill is up, comes up because I'd like to engage in an extended uh, debate. One of those was on the death penalty, when we opposed the death penalty. Another time, during the 1982 recession, we used the rules, when I say we, I mean Senator Levin with me as a staff, uh, used the rules of the, fi of the filibuster to essentially stop a jobs bill until Senator Dole, who was the majority leader at that point, would, or uh, Senator Baker, the majority leader, yeah. Dole was head of the finance committee, would negotiate with us for more weeks of, of, of unemployment benefits. Because at that point, many people, the word used, had exhausted their unemployment benefits and had run out. So we essentially used the rule of the filibuster to get leverage over that legislation forcing them to negotiate with us. So I, I come from a perspective of having seen certain benefits. On the other hand, Senator Levin's position on the filibuster, which he did not, he did not support opposing, uh, eliminating it, but was very much in favor of what you call the talking filibuster, which basically would force somebody to come down and debate the bill, and what, I, from my perspective, for the smaller bill, ones where somebody like a Ron, Senator Ron Paul, who um, I'll be less generous than you can be, uh, is a real flake. Um, I call them other things, too. Okay. Uh, I think there are some bills that really could not stand the light of day of debate, and those bills will get through. But on other bills, like the voting rights bill, which is one where um, uh, Republicans see it as a power grab, Democrats see it as a central democracy, there, I think, just forcing them to debate would not be enough, which comes to your uh, reference to the carve out. So I guess what I'm saying is, and this is more a question of comment, asking for comment, even somebody who has seen the benefits of the filibuster and has used those on behalf of causes that probably most people here would agree with, could come to the conclusion that now, at least in some circumstances, there have to be reforms, whether that be in the form of a requiring a talking filibuster or uh, a carve out on certain issues that are fundamental to the overall function of government. So, so uh, I, I, and you, you raise a very interesting point and also let me thank you for your work. It's always nice to meet a colleague and uh, especially somebody who worked for a, a titan like Carl Levin, somebody I really truly, truly admired. And I'm very sorry to hear that he passed. I will tell you that in 1982, for an example, it was only seven years after this 1975 carve-out, and I, I have a, a graph I didn't use that shows kind of year by year the frequency and the increase with which the filibuster has been used. And one of the interesting things, you talk about sending a letter to the cloakroom to, to say that you're going to put a hold on the bill. Well, let me tell you how it's currently working. The cloakrooms, the, the Senate leadership offices, rather, they, they send out an email saying, these are the votes that are coming goes to the legislative directors and chiefs of staff, et cetera. Anybody got a problem with it? Anybody want to stop it? Going once, going twice, and all you need to do is send an email, and it says, me. And that's how Marco Rubio and Ted Cruz and Rand Paul, and, and unless they want to claim public credit for it, they don't have to. That's the sickness. That's part of the sickness. The other part of the sickness is, is it right? it's exactly the point. You can reform the filibuster without killing it entirely because we need to prevent tyranny. And that is tyranny of the minority or tyranny of the majority. And currently we're suffering tyranny of the minority, which is, which is exactly what Hamilton said in that slide that I put up there. So 
I like to use the phrase during the Affordable Care Act. When I was working in the House, my, my job was to um, kind of come up with a coordinated message for all the Democrats, which was, uh, you know, when they talk about herding cats, there's a reason why Will Rogers said, I'm not a member of an organized party, I'm a Democrat. Um, he would come up with, with these slogans, right? And we'd come up with these messaging slogans when it was around health care and Republicans were trying to overturn the Affordable Care Act pretty much every day. I don't know, it was hundred, over 100 times that they voted. Um, we had this saying, it was fix it, don't nix it. And, and I think that applies to the Senate as well. I, th I think it's, it's an important idea to, to fix the filibuster, but retain some element of it, which is why the idea of a talking filibuster to me is so potent. Because having been a part of one, <laughs> that experience was not a filibuster. Like I said, it was just a talkathon. Um, we didn't delay a vote, we didn't do anything. We just didn't yield the floor. But I think just the experience of that was enough to convince me that it could be worthwhile because I remember at around 10.30 in the morning when Mitch McConnell came to the floor, maybe it was around 6 a.m., I, I lose track. Honestly, I really did truthfully live fall asleep on C-SPAN sitting in the chair next to my boss while he was speaking. Um, so that's a little point of humiliation because there is footage of that. but. When senators started hearing him as they woke up throughout the day, throughout the morning, some of them, some of his colleagues actually came to the floor and joined him and he, he was able to yield to them and they were able to speak and listen. And that's the whole idea of the whole place. And if it doesn't do that anymore, then it's just an anachronism. And then, then maybe some people who think it shouldn't exist are right. Dan, thank you for sharing your experiences. Thank you. Thank you. First, I want to say thank you. I really enjoyed your presentation and how um, a lot of stuff you touched on. I'm in Professor Himmelfarb's class. And, Lucky you. Um, we also <laughs> touched on that, so I'd like to see you know the relation and actually get it from you. So this is more so, um, I guess, a question about your journey from the transition from college to you know making your way up to Washington and how you were able to you know have your voice be heard and um, how you're able to, I guess get out there, be taken seriously, and, uh, you know, move forward within your career. Because obviously, politicians in the White House, to me, can be a bit intimidating, so it would be nice to hear how your journey was. Well, if people start taking me seriously, I'll let you know. <laughs> Until that starts happening, I can tell you that, um, you know, and Dr. Prady knows this story probably better than most people I know. Um, I did not have a straight line. And, um, you know, again, at the risk of sounding like a commencement speaker, like I felt like I was before, which I really don't want to do, um, I can tell you that, at least in my experience so far, very few people really have a straight line in life. And when they do, it's straight and boring and uninteresting. For me, um, I started getting involved in local politics when I was a teenager, knocking on doors for local elected officials. I was a, I became a Democratic committeeman as soon as I was old enough, which is was actually the only elected position I'd ever won. Um, when I was in high school, as Dr. Party mentioned, I, I got really incensed by the idea that our school district was facing a massive economic financial ca catastrophe because of a reluctance to raise taxes even nominally over 13 years, zero tax increases. And, and that just drove me crazy because the response was, we're just going to get rid of everything that every student cares about. We're going to make you pay to play football. We're going to make you not have music or theater or arts or education or any of the things that make a well-rounded person. So I, I said, screw this. They should have a student on the school board. And, and I, I um, ran in that election and actually went becoming very controversial. And uh, it's a whole other story. If you, if you want, I'll, I'll, you can email me. Um, but uh, yeah, I went to Nassau Community College first and uh, was not much of a student in high school. I had a hard time, and, but I was active. I went to Nassau. I became a student. I did well academically. I transferred to George Washington University. And it was there that I got the opportunity to intern on Capitol Hill, which was a, a remarkable experience because I got to do it twice. They asked me to come back, which was rare and, and wonderful. And it was because of the busyness of the Judiciary Committee and the impeachment. But uh, my dad got sick, and I needed to come home and help out. And I took some time off of school. And that's how I wound up here at Hofstra, actually. My, 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 my parents were, were kind of distraught that I was home and helping them instead of back in school. And my 
I don't know, it was my mom and my dad came up with the idea, you know, you should call Jim Schuert, president of the university. Your stadium is named after him. I was like, yeah, sure. I'm going to call the president of the university. He's going to sit down with me and help me figure out this conundrum of having 120 credits but not graduating yet. And sure enough, I called Jim Schuert and he sat down with me and helped me figure out the conundrum of having 120 credits and not having graduated. And I enrolled here at Hofstra. And it was honestly, it was one of the best things that ever happened to me in, in terms of my path politically, because while I was here, I still had two classes left, a Democratic Party chairman in Suffolk County, Rich Schaefer, um, offered me the opportunity to run for the legislature in what was considered to be a suicide race. What made matters even more challenging was that it was 2001, primary day was September 11th, and there was a new tone in this country. Um, there was an unstoppable sense that Republicans were in charge in New York with Rudy Giuliani and George Pataki and George W. Bush coming to stand on the rubble of 9-11. And almost every elected official that I knew was running or any challenger was running as a Republican had photos with all of those men on all their campaign literature. And I was talking about paid child care and providing low-cost women's health services and, and things that were a little bit maybe, uh, I don't want to say ahead of their time, but certainly not appropriate for that race if I wanted to win. But I will say um, I did the best any challenger did against my opponent So I, I, in, in a very tough year. But um, after that, I got to work in the Suffolk County Legislature, which I, I really do think that it's our local governments throughout the country that are the incubators of democracy and ideas in Suffolk County. We, we're the first in the nation bottle recycling law, which doesn't sound like much, but think about a state that doesn't have it. When you look at the can, and it says like the three or four states that say except that, that started in Suffolk County um, and many others. I can go on and on. But uh, I worked there for a while and I went on to run a nonprofit and Congresswoman Carolyn McCarthy was looking for a communications director. And I applied for the job. I, I was about I was around 30 years old. And I realized that if I was ever going to go back to Washington and finish what I started, it was then or never. And I applied for the job, and I remember distinctly my interview with Carolyn McCarthy. Um, this is really embarrassing, but I'm going to tell the story anyway. I had a brand new suit. I sat down on the couch, and it was just tailored, and the whole seam opened up to the back in the middle of my interview. Because I know you knew that because I was like, why is this couch so cold? Um, but anyway. Um, yeah, I, I wound up getting a job anyway. But I, I remember her asking me, she's like, you've never been a communications director or press secretary before. And I said, well, Congresswoman, with all due respect, I've been running the Babylon Arts Council for four years, and I've been in Newsday more than you. And that's how I got the job. And I moved down to D.C. My job with Carolyn did not go smoothly. I didn't love it. But she used to represent this school. She used to represent this part of Long Island. And um, I left for about a year. I came back to work for a congresswoman named Laura Richardson from California, who had the distinction of being the ninth member of Congress to ever be officially reprimanded on the House floor for corruption. And I got to learn a thing or two about crisis communications in that job and what it's like to be on the other side of the good guys. And I was fortunate to then get the job that I dreamed about my first week working on Capitol Hill, which was to run the Democratic Message Group, which uh, was Congressman Pallone, who's now chairman of the Energy and Commerce Committee, and the most significant committee in Congress, uh, uh, one of them, uh, was, was in charge of. And um, that just gave me unbelievable access and, and, and really a power to help. And the rest is pretty much what I told you. Thank you. Thanks for the question. By the way, I just want to warn you about something. I swear to you, I had hair exactly like yours when I was in high school. So watch out. <laughs> well, I would like to begin uh, by first thanking you for your time coming here at Hofstra and uh, speaking to us. Uh, my I have two questions, if you don't mind. Sure. Uh, my first question regards uh, the polarization that the electorate is experiencing right now and how one issue, there seems to be two dividing viewpoints. And if you lean towards one party, you choose one. And if you lean towards another party, you choose another. However, I feel like something like the filibuster can be used to kind of unite the electorate, because I feel like this is something that both parties, at least, have some unfavorable viewpoint of. So do you think that uh, filibuster reform can be something that can unite the electorate? 
You know, it, it's a very good question, and, I, and the truth is I don't know the answer to it because during the primary in uh, 2016, there was a, and, and to be in full disclosure, my boss considered running in that race as well, and we did all the trips to New Hampshire and Iowa and South Carolina and Nevada, and honestly, it was one of the most thrilling experiences of my life to even be in that, that formative idea of running for the presidency, with, uh, working for somebody running for the presidency in those early stages. But Senator Warren and Senator Mer uh, Merkley and Senator uh, uh, Sanders all had very similar views on it, right? And, and one of the things that I think has gotten us off topic on the filibuster is that Senator Sanders and Senator Warren did get in the race. Senator Merkley did not. His voice was not a part of that discussion. And Senators Warren and Biden and and, uh, and, um, and Sanders were the only ones who really wanted to talk too much about the filibuster. And they used the phrase eliminate. And I think that when you hear something like eliminate a standard practice of something that you don't even understand, there's something that just turns off in the minds of voters. And there's also something that turns off in the mind of voters when you talk about the idea of some arcane Senate rule. And I think this is the problem that Democrats make that Republicans are so adept at avoiding. When Democrats talk about something, whether it's the filibuster or anything, I'm going to steal this from, from a, 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 a scholar, a not Schenker, uh, uh, Sario, who describes it this way. We talk about issues instead of talking about it like the way we would talk about a box of brownies. If you went into the supermarket and you saw a box of brownies, what's on the front of the box? easy answer. It's a picture of a brownie. You know what's not on the front of the box? Monosodium, glutamine, whatever, weird red dye number five. The ingredients. The box doesn't advertise that inside is just a bag of powder. And that bag of powder does not do anything without your input of eggs and water and oil or whatever else it calls for. Democrats need to stop talking about the ingredients of the filibuster or any other issue, and talk about the brownie. Talk about the delivery. Talk about what it is that we're working on. So I don't think it's a matter of, of parties coming together on uh, and everybody feeling better about the filibuster or, or, or Senate rules. I think the fact that anybody ever has to hear about or talk about Senate rules is embarrassing. You don't watch a football game and hear all the rules about how referees make their decisions. So that's that's my belief. You watch the damn game. Thank you. And my uh, second question uh, revolves around uh, President Biden. If you were to give him a letter grade, especially as someone who leans traditionally left, uh, what would you give him and why? I, I, I wouldn't because, to be honest, I, I, have, um, I like President Biden. Um, I have met him a number of times. I think he's a, a really, truly, and this is not a partisan thing, he, as people say, he is a very decent man. Um, I think that his administration is addressing challenges that no administration had ever addressed before. Any administration can point to divisions of the country at different points, or you know, even more recent history of the civil rights movement. We had, you know, divisions over Vietnam. We had a civil war, a little thing like that. Um, but did they do it with a layer of a pandemic? Did they do it with opposition coming from absolutely outlandish lies that are somehow promulgated as fact? I won't grade President Biden. First of all, his, uh, his, he hasn't even had his midterm exam yet. Um, second of all, I, I, I think that given all the circumstances that the administration is, is trying to deal with on a daily basis, um, I, I think that it is a, a piecemeal process, but everybody wants the damn brownie. We want a solution that's delicious and easy, and it's just powder and we just add water. That ain't the way it works. And nobody knows that better than a guy who spent 36 years in the Senate. Now, I will say, as a criticism, I do think they could do a better job of working with the Senate. I think they could do a better job with communicating. I think they could do a better job with prioritizing what, what issues they're working on. Um, that being said, I, I also wouldn't want that job in a million years. I've learned that my place is to run from elective office, not for it. So. Thank you. Thanks. Hi. 
thank you for co <clears throat> thank you for coming and speaking to us. Uh, my question is more about you know a lot of us are probably thinking about going to intern in D.C., especially on Capitol Hill, yeah. especially in you know representative offices. So how do we get from that step of getting the internship doing well to maybe asking about getting a return offer for next year once we graduate? Or what is the process typically like for, for um, you know, an incoming senior to get a job after college? I, I think that's a great question. I talk to a lot of interns in my office every, every year, uh, every semester, actually. And look, there, there, there's no one way of doing this. Uh, some people would argue that the best way to do it is intern in your senior year, whether it's the fall or spring semester, then keep those contacts. Make sure that you make a damn good impression if you get there. And, and, and I mean that. Um, I, I will tell you that when I was interning, I don't know, I don't think I was the best intern, but I'll tell you, I showed up every day. I had to take 15 credits full time because that's the way GW did it. Most interns, if you guys go from Hofstra, you're going to get a full semester of credits. We had to do the same amount of hours, plus I was taking a full course load. And it just so happened to be in a national crisis, so I was putting in like 60 hours a week there instead of 30 hours a week. But make a good internship uh, impression. I still talk to the guy who was a legislative correspondent when I started interning and is now chief of staff for Jerry Nadler. He's still there. So people have long memories. I think that's the first step. The, the, Never be afraid to ask for more work. Never be afraid to, to, to distinguish yourself. And please don't ever be afraid to ask questions because the worst interns I've ever had are the ones who don't ask questions and just do things and they do them wrong. And the other piece of advice I would give you is that, you know, I argue with people about this all the time. I do a lot of hiring in my role as a communications director and I'm a senior advisor for the senator's office so I have a lot of input on who we hire for whatever position. And... Um, there are a few few things. Uh, one is there's this distinction between people who have the means, and I think this is one of the reasons why Washington's so dysfunctional, honestly, because it is full of people who had the financial means and financial support to be able to take those really low-paying jobs and not worry about whether or not they had to cover rent or food or health care. And they could just come do an internship for free and, and their parents would get them an apartment or, or whatever arrangement they, they wanted. And then there are kids like me. I don't have a penny to my name. I had nothing. And I will tell you that it is, uh, as my, my, my grandfather used to saying, you can be rich and you can be poor, rich is better. Um, my feeling is that, um, you know, absent that help, I, I, I think that it's really important um, to, to try where you can, but do I think that you wind up becoming a better, more informed Capitol Hill staffer if you take the easy path, you, you start the internship, you get the staff assistant job, then maybe you want to go to the communications, you get the press assistant job, and maybe you get like a deputy press secretary job, and maybe you work up to a press secretary, and maybe a deputy communications director, and a communications director, or whatever, or you want to take the legislative route, and you, you wind up as a staff assistant again, and you, you, you start off, and you're in your legislative correspondent, and a legislative aide, and then maybe you become a senior legislative aide, and a policy expert, and a legislative director, like our friend here, you you can do it whether it's your first job or maybe you're a little bit richer in experience and knowledge if you live a little and try to get in. But it is not easy. It is a very competitive place. You know, I, I, I was talking to a friend of mine before I was preparing for the speech, and I was like, I just, you know, it's kind of silly to me. Like, I don't know why anybody think, cares about what we have to think. And he's, he reminded me, he said, you know, in Washington, you may feel like you're one of 100 people out of your job, to the other 365 million people in this country, you are only one of 100 people that have your job. So it is kind of, to me, a place where you can define yourself and you can follow the course that feels right to you. And that's the only real answer that there is to that. And, you know, and, and, but don't feel a rush because one thing about Washington is it's very good at insulating itself and it will always be there. Okay. Hello. I just wanted to thank you for coming. I uh, really loved your presentation. Uh, my question is, considering the growing proportion of progressives in the Democratic Party, uh, why do you think Democrats are more dedicated to winning over, like, mythical swing voters, I'll call them, instead of the progressives in their own party? And do you think the party would be better off embracing progressivism? Ooh, that's not a minute-long question to answer. <laughs> <laughs> but, uh, you know... 
I, I, I don't know. I think, I think we are all putting too much emphasis on this. The fact is that I could be as progressive as I want. I could be as far left as I want. I could be a centrist if I want. But the fact is we are not a country where we can just choose which people we choose to respect. We have to respect everybody's point of view. And as a Democratic Party, we are a big tent party, as it's often said. And a lot of people say that that's a bad thing because maybe the tent should be skewed and there should be one tent pole that's larger than the other. But I, I don't think that that's true. I think that the core basic ideals and ideas of the Democratic Party are easy ones for everybody in our party to get behind, whether they're super progressive or more moderate. And those are ideas that, that really create an equal opportunity for everybody. Uh, that creates things like the Equality Act, another bill that my boss introduced for the first time in 2015 when we got the honor of having a press conference with John Lewis in the LBJ room where the Civil Rights Act was signed. That was a moving moment. And yet we still haven't passed it. But you know what? I think it's hard pressed to find a Democrat in our party that doesn't believe that you should be protected through a full slate of civil rights, no matter who you are, or who you love, and how you identify as a human being. Those are the things that, that unite us as a party. And those aren't left or right issues, those are humanity issues. And I think that if we talk more about humanity issues, and we talk more about the damn brownies, we'll get there without having to make a choice. Thank you. Oh, yeah, yeah. I want to say thank you. Thank you to all of you for being here, to members of the class, to people who are not uh, of our classes, to people who are not uh, in our class. Um, and thank you for asking for such asking such good questions. Thank you, guys. Thank you. That dance floor.